want to make sure that folks on the line, can you hear me? I can hear you, Marco, but I'm having trouble hearing other folks. It's going kind of in and out. Testing, testing, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm speaking up, so am I to do that? Yeah. No, I mean, the, the, the overhead microphone should pick everything up, um, uh, but you're able to hear uh, Melissa and myself, Max? Yeah, I think the issue is coming in when folks are speaking over people. So just like oh, okay. be careful to the one yeah. at a time. Sounds good. Thank you, Max. Um, so we can get started with the with the meeting. All right. All right. Thank you, everyone, for being at the March PRC or sorry April PRC <laughs> meeting. We are in a interesting situation today, where for the first time in my time being on the PRC, we have not met quorum in person, um, and that is okay. Uh, we will have some special things that we'll have to do, including Sarah, unfortunately, asking you to take some time to take care of yourself and sign off. Marco will speak to that. Yes. And so I'll go ahead and pass it off to Mark. Let's get to it. <laughs> Thank you, Shruti. Um, so in, in the uh, cases where we are unable to meet quorum for our electronic meetings policy, uh, the commission cannot take action or vote on any item uh, that is being presented before, uh, before the body. Uh, the good news is there are no um, items up for discussion today that require or a vote or action. Uh, it, will, it would also affect how we do certain kinds of business. So, for example, um, as part of our introduction and approval of meeting minutes, uh, typically we're able to approve uh, meeting minutes as part of our general business. That will not be able uh, to be done to the, uh, tonight. We'll have to table that discussion for the next meeting when we are able to reach an in-person quorum, uh, as well as any other business that may require any sort of decision, either by the commission or the chair, um, that may come up during tonight's meeting. So anything that may require, you know, the decision to write a letter or to um, assign uh, a commission member to a particular uh, project or event or anything of that nature uh, would need to be tabled for a future meeting. So that is the, the main uh, gist of it. Uh, in terms of participation virtually, uh, and I'm speaking, I think, Sarah, and is that Mark Lincoln? Mark, are you online uh, tonight? Yes. OK, so I'm uh, speaking specifically to Sarah and Mark as commission members. Um, unfortunately, you, you will not be able to participate as a commission member at tonight's meeting since we don't have a physical quorum. Uh, there are two options. Uh, you are able to stay um, and spectate, uh, or um, the option would be to uh, leave the meeting and then join us again uh, once we're able to reach a full in-person quorum. Uh, the recommendation by our county attorney's office because of the issues related to FOIA is for you to leave the meeting um so that is up to you uh because there are the way the virtual meeting the whole purpose is to be able to participate Sorry. so the, yeah so there is personal liabilities associated with foia and that's why i'm letting you know that you do yeah. have this option so if you'd like to stay that's up to you or you can choose to leave the meeting at this time uh but thank you anyway for your participation and uh with that said um i can move forward with um just introducing the meeting if you think that's fine yeah. all right Actually, wait, should we ask some questions? Okay, we will be holding public comment as part of this. Yes. Um, can we have discussion after each? Uh, we can have a general discussion, but again, no actions can be taken. Okay, so questions from the commissioners in the room. The ones that are in the room, yes. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, that's it. Okay. Great. All right. Um, so again, uh, my name is Marco Rivero. I am with the Park and Recreation Commission. I am the staff liaison. Um, I would like to remind our attendees that the PRC meeting will be recorded. Um, we also ask commissioners and presenters and attendees, please mute, mute your microphones and turn off your video feeds if you're not speaking. For those attending via telephone, you can mute and unmute your microphones by dialing star six. The top toolbar contains a raise your hand function in case a commission member or presenter has a question. In this case, uh, we will not be uh, doing that. So for those of you, you commissioners that are attending, um, you'll be able, you'll only be able to uh, attend as a spectator, or again, you can step off the, the call. Uh, the chat box will also be checked routinely, mainly to address logistical questions or issues during the meeting. Um, as way of information, we'll be holding a public comment period at the beginning of the meeting. 
Each public commenter will have up to three minutes for public comment, and I will signal to the speaker once time is up. And thank you very much. I will turn it over to our chair. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for being here regardless. To Sarah and Mark, it's really just based on personal liability. I would suggest you guys just stay on mute if you'd like to listen in to what we're talking about. Um, we have two items on today's list. We will not be talking about letters at all, so other business is canceled. Okay. Um, but I'm excited to get into what we can focus on today. We're getting into like the drier months of summer in terms of content. So as always, if you have any interest in PRC 101 topics, bring them up. This is the time. We'll also soon be talking about field trip ideas. August is our field trip month. Um, we're still fresh on that. And so maybe this is the warm up brainstorm for next month's coming to ask you for your ideas. Really good. Okay. Um, yes, let's go ahead and get started then All right. with public comment. Are there, is there anyone signed up for public comment now? No one is officially signed up for public comment, but I do want to recognize Mr. Huber Robinson, who okay. has joined us tonight uh, for uh, the PRC meeting. I'm not sure if you wanted to introduce yourself or speak to any particular item. Uh, the reason I came for um, actually several reasons. Yeah. I'm involved in a piece of parkland that our Bluemont Civic Association is attempting to have it recognized as a park. There's also a question about whether or not an individual can create a garden in that area. They are, both those issues are working. Uh, the garden is a little bit controversial, and the other issue apparently is going to take quite a bit of time to get through the hoops. And as I focused on these issues. I started to play around on the Arlington County web and found all these commissions <laughs> and yeah. committees that have an order on the water, in addition to all of the various uh, units within parks and natural resources that have a comment, and then all the volunteer organizations that would have something to do with having a garden put in. Is it a garden? Is it nature area. So all those issues came up and I became aware of this meeting happened to happen coming up before our next uh, civic association meeting next week. So I wanted to familiarize myself with your operation and uh, I was very grateful and gratified that I talked to Marcos boss for about an hour before coming here and nice. uh, he answered quite a few of the questions that I had. So the whole idea was how do you get the train started and how many stops does it make along the way before you get to your destination? So yeah. that's it. And then they got happy to be here. So I just want to acknowledge thank you for coming. And um, my understanding is that this is an issue that the staff has to be looking into but I want to say, like, in addition to us just knowing about the issue, the Parks and Recreation Commission role here is really to be in line with the citizens and civic associations and all those downstream organizations we just talked about to represent the public voice when it comes to these subjects. So the way the action item that we have, the way that we do that is by advocating through the county board through letters with unprecedented access to staff, right, to get our questions answered, just like you did today. And so if we can be helpful in that way, let us know. And also, rest assured, when the time comes to really talk about Lumont, um, there will be a moment for us to be able to personally advocate where we'll be coming to you. Well, basically. that was my understanding that you would be in this sort of that final approval uh, area yeah. and making a recommendation to the board. And of course, that, 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 that takes time, right? That's way after staff gets to their actual time, um, to their actual mm -hmm. Um, recommendation. And so please keep us involved as you struggle through that. And, and just uh, an aside, I am a volunteer tree steward and have been for about 12 years now. I have probably been in three quarters of the county parks, pruning trees, assessing them, and whatever. I've been at every Arlington uh, public school campus. Uh, working with their staff nice. and maintaining their trees. So I feel I have a pretty good idea of how the county operates on that level of providing tree and park maintenance and invasive removal and whatever. So that's my background. Thank you. 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 Thank you
And I don't believe we have any other public commenters uh, tonight. Okay, good. All right. And we won't take anything from uh, the, the virtual participants. No, not at this time. Okay, great. Okay, then we're going to move on to our first item today, um, which is um, the introductory conversation about a park naming project, Highview Park. So just as a reminder, we get this presentation today from Max. Then he goes around and shops it to civic association, historical preservation folks, and then they come back to us with the combined learnings that they got from that process. We then actually do both. So that would require us to have a quorum, of course. Um, and uh, after that, it goes to the county board. We write a letter on it. Okay. So, so before uh, we move forward, in terms of uh, folks that are using laptops in the room, um, I would suggest if you can mute your microphones, because I think that's going to minimize with the feedback. So just FYI. All right, Max. Awesome. Uh, well, hold on one moment. I'll pull up the presentation. Um, and uh, a link to this presentation should be on your um, as part of like the agenda packet in, in, in PDF form. <clears throat> All righty. Um, hello, uh, my name is Max Ewert. I'm an associate planner with the Department of Parks and Recreation, and am here today to discuss a proposal to rename the baseball field at Highview Park to Alfred Foreman Senior Field. Um, on the screen now is the field at Highview Park, framed by North Dinwiddie Street on the west and North Cameron Street on the east. Um, the county naming policy requires that county facilities, including parks and, in this case, a facility in a park, shall generally be named according to the geographical, historical, or ecological relationship with the site. Um, the Commission, the Parks and Rec Commission, will seek comment from the Historic Affairs and Landmark Review Boards, the HALRB, um, and the Arlington Neighborhood Advisory Committee, ARNAC, um, and the appropriate neighborhood civic associations. Um, the applicant, the Halls Hill High View Park Historic Preservation Coalition, which is a mouthful, um, has reached out to the High View um, Park Civic Association, who are in support, and we are awaiting a formal letter of support that will come uh, at some point, hopefully soon. Um, and I just wanted to note that uh, for a lot of these naming processes, uh, you typically get a couple options for um the what the park name could be um usually we try to break it down into those geographical historic or ecological relationships however since this is something that is being proposed by a community organization they've indicated that they are just searching to rename the field to the alfred to be um, named for alfred foreman senior um and that if it is that is not something that um uh, the PRC is interested in supporting, then they would rather not rename the field at all. Um, the proposed facility name is to honor Alfred Foreman Sr. He's a native Arlingtonian who lived in the Highview Park neighborhood and whose family continues to live there. Alfred Foreman Sr. worked as a DPR employee for over 25 years, primarily working at the Langston Brown Community Center, and was deeply involved in the athletics program at the nearby facility. Additionally, the um, Preservation Coalition are working with Historic Preservation staff to apply for a grant to have a marker erected in his honor. In the image on the right, the proposed banner with the field name is outlined in red, and the location of the marker is located in orange. Um, we will be sure to work with PNR, uh, Parks and Natural Resources um, staff, to ensure that these proposed areas are in line with the county's policies for baseball fields. Um, the next steps are, um, as Trudy uh, outlined earlier, to head over to the ARNAC and HALRB uh, meetings to uh, propose these names and get feedback from them. After that, we would um, come back here for a final vote um, 
to for the proposed name that would be recommended to the county board. Um, our uh, tentative plan is to head to the RNAC and HALRB meetings in May, which are already scheduled, and then back here in June, hopefully for a formal vote, um, but July if needed. Um, the tentative target date for the county board meeting is July 2023. Um, and with that, I'm happy to answer any questions that folks may have. Thank you, Max. Thank you very much. This is great. Um, yeah, go ahead. So we're, this is not renaming the park, but renaming the field in the park. That is 100% correct. Yes, it'll still be Highview Park. However, the baseball field will be named, would be named, sorry, for Alfred Foreman Sr. So it would be Alfred Foreman Sr. Field in Highview Park. Has this been done before? I, this is a new thing to me. I, I, I've heard we've named parks, but I've never named a structure. Know, we never named it. Well, we Jenny Dean. Park. Jenny Dean Jenny has Dean. Dean. Yes. Jenny Dean did, did that, but I just kind of thought that was all part of the deal. Wait, what's Jenny, Jenny Dean? What? Is it Jenny Dean Field? The Jenny Dean Park? the Field. Oh, well, that's the same name. That, that, yeah, exactly, yeah. but it still yeah. was. So, so this is the first, Max? No problem. Just I was, yeah, I just, it's new to me. Yeah, so the Jenny Dean Field is, is an example of this. However, however, I will agree that this is, um, uh, not necessarily common with uh, our, our park facilities. However, after kind of going through the, the county naming policy, we are, are fairly confident that this is totally in line with that. Um, as our, our definitions, uh, or our county definitions for what a facility is, is rather vague, but playgrounds are included in that and, and fields as well. Um, so we figured that uh, this is something that would um adhere to that county naming policy but nothing is replacing the name of this field right now it's just the field right? in Highview park in Highview park that's correct okay. that's correct yes which is why it makes sense they're not going to be there and i don't think you know in past we um look forward to seeing the alternates that come in mm -hmm. you know that staff recommends and the proposal right and i think in this case instead we're saying i'm i'm looking forward to seeing the history uh -huh. that comes from um, the uh, Neighborhood Conservation Commission and the HLRB as well. So, yeah, we'll add that. So, Shruti, I see that Adam's hand is up, but I think he's joined late. So, I will reiterate what I said earlier in the meeting today. Um, so, because of not being able to reach uh, an in person quorum, Adam, um, no commission members who are participating virtually uh, is able to participate within the discussion uh, per our electronic meetings policy. Uh, the recommendation by the county attorney's office is to either step off of the meeting or um, you can still attend, but as a spectator or someone attending the meeting. Uh, that is the recommendation and guidance that we did get from the attorney's office. So. Just wanted to give you a heads up. This was mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, so we will not be recognizing any virtual participation or discussion because we're, we don't have it in person for him tonight. Apologies, Adam. Really. Um, to, to provide a little bit more context on um, the, uh, hold on, let me make sure I'm getting their name right. The, the Halls Hill Highview Park um, Historic Preservation Coalition. Um, they are a, a local group um, that located in the Highview Park neighborhood who are trying to bring uh, more of an attention, more attention to the local history, especially of the um, black population that has lived there, um, dating back to when the neighborhood was segregated. Um, cool. And that, that, that's their primary goal through these projects. Daniel, do you want to um, yeah, just, just out of curiosity, um, did, did the organization give any sort of explanation as to chose the path of like renaming the baseball field as opposed to pursuing the adoption of naming the park. It's just curiosity as to why they chose that. Um, from my conversations with them, Alfred Foreman Sr. was um, his involvement in, in the athletics, um, specifically through the sports uh, at the rec center, is their primary motivation for that. Um, however, I'm, I'm not sure if there's any reason beyond that, that they're um, focusing more on the um the field rather than the park itself but that's something that i can definitely um ask them and uh, bring back once we reconvene at a, at a future meeting oh no there's okay. no 
Uh, Mac, I was wondering, what's the current use of the field? Is it, is it youth or is it a uh, travel team field? Is it a uh, general open playground field? Or just a square space? Or I'm not sure. I don't, is it, is it on? Is it, is it a regularly scheduled baseball diamond? I don't know um, what, what its current use is. I didn't measure, but I did a site visit last week and it appeared to be youth size. However, I can confirm that it could be so, so, some of these um, um, fields can be fitted for, for both. Um, and I can confirm that with our PNR staff. Because I was thinking if this is like a school field, like around Quincy, uh, <laughs> you know, it's a not that it would make a difference in the naming, but but certainly everyone would know about the name change because it's on everybody's schedule. At any rate, so I, I, I think it's pretty much a small local park. I don't I don't see a lot of organized sports happening yeah. there, but there's room for like youth soccer and uh, youth baseball. Nice. Okay, no, thank you. I was just curious as to its current current use. Any other questions? Oh, thank you, Max. Looking forward to June slash July uh, when we have you back. Alrighty. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. All right. We're going to swiftly move to our second topic for the night. Um, we have Bridget here. Thank you so much for being here from DES to talk to us about the Arlington Boulevard Trail Feasibility Study. And I know this has a smaller scope than what I was initially um, expecting, so I'm excited to learn more about it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for having me. I share my screen. I don't know if I should talk louder so people on the call can hear me. We'll see. Bridget, if there's an issue with sharing, I do have it queued up here as well. Oh, you do? Okay. There's, there's a problem just letting the content. Oh, well, let me try one more time. Sure. I'll say my screen. Yeah, there we go. Perfect. Okay, there we go. So thank you for having again having me again. My name is Bridget Opikoya. I'm a transportation planner at DES, and I've been working on this Arlington Boulevard Trail study since last February, and we kicked off the kickoff in March with a walking tour, and I don't know if any of you were in that walk, but um, we had uh, the Transportation Commission Chair, Chris Slack, board member, and other staff members and community groups participated in that, and we are also working with consultant tool design. And there's a little bit of a lag, so I apologize for that. So, we now have a draft study that we are about to publish, hopefully within the next week. Um, they did send over some great recommendations, and I, I want to tell you all about them and how we got to this point, but there is a formal study that will be published to the website soon. Before I do that, I'll just give you a little bit about the background and how we got here. So the Arlington Boulevard Trail is one of several trails that make up this bicycle network. And uh, the study area is in blue along Arlington Boulevard. And you can see the green is the full length of the trail. And it's disparate. It's, it's disconnected in parts. It's on a trail. It's on the street in some parts. It's uh, discontinuous in parts. But um, it is a great trail and a great facility because it connects to larger trails that can encircle this trail that goes east-west through consider it as uh, a very important show. And you can see that in the upper left um, screen, the Arlington Loop is what it's called. So how we got here. So um, we have several adopted plans that um, speak to uh, trail improvements along this corridor. And over quite a bit of time, we've heard people complain um, internally and externally about the need for improvements to this multi-use trail. So the county board did allocate $200,000 in the 2022-24 um, CIP 
for us to study what would be feasible along this trail. And so we started last spring and we are ending um, this month. The object objectives are to dis develop some concepts that improve the existing sections. Um, there are some areas that are quite narrow, uh, and I'll get into that and show you some of the images, but we want to remove um, those pinch points or widen them um, and remove some of the other barriers that we have that um, actually make it quite unpleasant to um, use. And we've also identified some preferred routing and some other improvements at intersections, and we wanted to make sure we included um, some ADA accessibility in parts where there are none, um, or there are substandard, I should say, um, exceed, update, or exceed, meet or exceed the Master Transportation Plan recommended trail widths. Again, we want to remove those barriers and provide a more direct path where they're possible. So, uh, in the Master Transportation Plan, um, it's mentioned in the goals and policies of the MTP. It's mentioned in the bike elements and the pedestrian element, the, the need for improvements to this trail. And also the public spaces master plan mentions trails. And um, we also have a vision zero action plan, which came on board later, that includes part of this area. So we have plenty of guidance that will um, guide us through this process. And it's important to note that uh, the entire trail that we're looking at um, is within the dot right away. So this is this is very significant because it's requiring a lot of coordination with VDOT and they've been with us in this process every step of the way. It's only been through conversations though. Nothing has been sent to them for approval, which I've been told can be a different story. So just so you know. But that's where we are. We have been um, collaborating with them. So where are we today? Um, the trail itself is um, that we're studying is a 1.3 mile area and it starts at North Jackson Street. I will show you a map of that. And it travels west to George Mason Drive, and then it comes back east um, from George Mason to the Jackson Street Bridge. So we have quite a few destinations within the trail area. Jefferson Middle School, Fleet Elementary, um, TJ Community Center, uh, the National Foreign Affairs Training Center, Columbia Garden Cemetery. There are several places of worship and lots of retail, including shopping and dining areas. So there's quite a bit in this small area um, that um, we are part of this. So for public engagement, we, um, as I noted, we started the study. We had a, a kickoff meeting and a walking tour. We've actually had two walking tours. The first one was informal, and uh, it was just the internal staff and a few people um, wanted to come along. Uh, Wabo was also a part of that. And so we then kicked off with a, a formal walking tour that included um, more members of the community and um, some of the same folks that came up before. And then after that, um, we took feedback from the community and from the walking tour. We started an online engagement forum. And then we got to work. We started looking at what we could do to improve the trail, uh, what would work, what wouldn't, and things like that. And so what we did was we took those draft recommendations and put them online as well so that we could show them to the public and gather feedback about that. And we did. We um, actually received quite a bit of feedback on that, and that process um, was quite successful. We also had an in-person pop-up and met with um, several of the community members to gather more feedback um, on the um, recommendations. So now we are here with our commission briefings. Um, This is everything I've just said, so I'll just skip that and go to the next slide. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, so the initial feedback that we received uh, wasn't as much as the second, I should say. So we received 166 responses. Um, there were some things that came out of it, which was very clear to us on the walking tour. People said they felt unsafe on the trail. Um, there were some bike, pedestrian, vehicle conflicts at intersections. Um, there is little to no buffer between the trail and travel lanes. It's not very welcoming, it feels narrow, it's not continuous, and then some of the areas there are um, issues with the pavement. And um, there were some other things that came out too, but the prevailing ones were the ones that I mentioned. So then we, out of that feedback, uh, we 
develop some draft concepts and they were. Um, this is what a typical section looks like. We have guardrails shown with a 10 foot trail um, adjacent to road. And <clears throat> what we attempted to do is to provide, in most cases, at least two alternatives in every segment where we could um, do more than one thing or propose more than one thing. And the responses were open ended, um, so people could provide more answers to the question, although each segment in which I will show you only had one question. Um, and in this process with these draft concepts, we worked internally with um, quite a few departments, including Parks and Recreation, um, Arlington Public Schools, VDOT, uh, Virginia Department of Natural Resources, and NFATC. And so from the drafts, we received more comments um, that really spoke to what people liked and what they didn't. So people liked that there was sufficient trail width and they proposed concepts in minimized impact to trees. There was quite a bit of beautiful separation and it seemed much more safe than what's out there today. And so there were some things that respondents wanted changed a little bit more. Um, I, I have to say that the first comment says priorities outside of the study area. Uh, because they were open-ended comments, people could say what they wanted. So most people said, well, I'd rather you look at Prison Drive, or I'd rather you look at you know, you know, another street, or I'd rather you go to Glee Road or what have you. So we wanted to honor those comments um, in the feedback, but recognize that we were only concentrating on the study area. So what people wanted changed was most people said nothing. Uh, which I thought was really nice. It let me know at least that we were starting to get to where people really liked the concepts and were comfortable with what we were proposing. Um, some people wanted the vehicle separation changed. Um, some people said they didn't like an alternative because we provided two alternatives in most cases. Um, this, um, in some cases, was not as specific as I'd like. It was open-ended. So were they talking about the preferred alternatives, which I'm getting to, or this or the second alternative is not clear, but um, some people said they didn't like the alternative to what they were being shown. So that's what we have. And again, some people said they didn't like that there were minimal tree impacts. And I, um, from looking at the responses, um, some people wanted more shading. Um, they didn't like that um, some trees were being lost as part of this because we are in some places widening trails. We did work with um, DPR staff um, urban forest was quite um, intently, though, on making sure that we did not impact trees to the extent that we could that were considered heritage or mature important trees. So um, we did identify some um, non-natives um, that weren't as important that um, we seem to be impacting in one of the recommendations which I get to. So these are the concepts that we have um, decided on. And I'm just going to show you how I'm breaking down these concepts. So I broke down the study area into seven segments. There are four areas on the north side of Arlington Boulevard, and there are three areas on the south side of Arlington Boulevard. And I broke them up based on the characteristics of the trail in that location. So for segment one, which is from um, North Jackson Street to Columbia Gardens entrance, this is what the image is showing you what it looks like today. Um, we have here um, the removal of a dying tree, and this was something that was brought to us from um, DPR staff when we went out to look at the trees. Um, it was determined that the tree, that was a pinch point um, where we would not be able to widen to 11 feet, and they said the tree was dying and it probably would not be standing by the time we started um, construction in this area anyway, so it was okay to widen to that particular but the main focus was to avoid mature healthy trees. So in this location, the trail is eight feet, we're widening it to 11. So that's really the only significant thing that's happening here. There, there was another alternative, which I will mention for segment one, and it is the, oh, sorry, I'm, I'm in segment two. So, that was segment one. So the only thing we're doing in segment one is widening to 11 feet. Segment two looks very similar to segment one, except that 
uh, there is a location, there's another pinch point where we have two trees. The tree is not dying, so we cannot remove it, or we do not want to remove it. We, we, we have two choices. We can either keep the AP or we can float the trail using an aeration mat. And this is the standard for uh, the root aeration matting that is in our county standard. So those were the two options, to keep it as it is and provide a pinch point or widen it with this mat to um, pr protect the root, the critical root zone. So these are the two options here. So another part of segment two, which um, is important to mention is along Arlington Boulevard at the off-ramp approaching Lee Road. I don't know if you guys can see in this image, I can see clearly on my screen, but there is a, a trail to the right of that off-ramp. It's some black asphalt there. Um, people really do, do not like this location. It's, it feels unsafe. You're immediately adjacent to cars. Um, it, there's no separation. So we recommended a buffer. Um, and if you notice, um, from the draft concepts to now, um, the way the buffer looks is different. The guardrail was shown in our first round of um, draft concepts. This one is showing vertical separation, which is uh, a Jersey barrier. We um, are not in the design phase yet, so we don't know what those ultimate vertical separations will be, but we do know that the Jersey barrier looks more substantial and provides a better level of comfort over the um, guardrail. So again, we're maintaining the 11 feet at this location, and just to the right where the trees are overgrown, um, there is um, a, a retaining wall that we will maintain. So the widening will happen into Offering. Okay, so so now I'm sorry. Did you have a question? Can we ask questions at the end, or do we? I I prefer that you do, but if you rather. Oh, okay. No, I'll, I'll wait. I'm just keeping. Okay. Do you guys have a certain preference? No, and it's great. And it's great. Okay. <laughs> All right. So at the intersection here, uh, we have a Glee Road. That image I just showed you, we were approaching westbound Leap Road on Arlington Boulevard at the off ramp. There is a, a, a right turn slip lane that takes you from southbound Leap Road. You can make the right here onto um, the Arlington Boulevard Trail. I'm sorry, Arlington Boulevard. I'm calling Arlington Boulevard Trail because that's the recommendation, but we'll get there. Um, so, one recommendation is to either remove the slip ramp. So that cars have to come to a stop and then make the right turn, which makes it uh, easier for cyclists to feel safe. Um, or what we would do is still provide some level of protection for the cyclists, but we would continue across, have some um, signal timing, um, a, a right turn signal specifically for bikes um, and vehicles. And then it would be a two, um, two, two part crossing at this location. So those are the two options that are on the table um, for this. And you can see there's a green arrow in the top in option one. Um, we are having some internal discussions about whether the crosswalk should be at the edge of the um, ramp or midways. It's just really based on vehicle behavior. So we're currently in discussions with our traffic signal team and our traffic design engineers to see what's the best approach at this intersection. So what you see here may be changed slightly before it gets to our first phase of design. Okay, so now you can see here we have this proposal along the <coughs> off-ramp that shows this is the, from the off-ramp if you're going across, continuing on Arlington Boulevard onto the on-ramp approaching George Mason Drive. Um, this is the ramp you see today. There is no facility for a pedestrian or a cyclist. What we're proposing is that we narrow this on-ramp 
and provide a trail facility adjacent to this on ramp. So that cyclists uh, won't have to exit the trail, make a right onto George Mason, and then make a left onto Cathedral Lane to continue on west to George Mason Drive, which I will show you as our second alternative. Because if this is, does not become a feasible option, we do have another alternative that we can show you. But for this one, it's um, to provide a new trail adjacent to the honor. So for this preferred location, what happens is the trail continues at the on-ramp and then it is requiring the removal of the first, I want to say this carefully, the first off-ramp to George Mason Drive. That makes sense. There are two approaching this intersection. We have one just at Thomas Street and then we have another one at George Mason. So there are two ramps. One that serves Thomas Street and Trenton Street, and then another one that serves George Mason. So what the closure of this first ramp does is um, force drivers who want to go to Trenton Street to go up to George Mason, make a right onto Second, and then turn into the community. And same thing, folks on Thomas currently turn on Trenton and then just make the right. So they would have to go one additional street. And this is what that looks like today. There is a new development there in Whitefield Crossing. So the alternative to providing this trail facility adjacent to the on-ramp, which provides that continuity, is for cyclists to and pedestrians to make the right off of the George, um, off of the Glebe Road off-ramp, make the right here at Glebe Road, and then make a left onto Cathedral Lane which then connects back to the service road I just showed you, right. which is what we're doing today. So it would just be the existing condition, but what we would do is still improve this condition um, where it becomes a one way. Uh, once we pass the Dunkin' Donuts and the McDonald's and cars will need to continue west and make a ride onto Thomas or keep straight onto the service road to George Mason if they want to travel in a different direction. We have a question about the presentation. I'm not sure what to say. This is something like that. Can you uh, share and reshape the presentation? I switched devices, could not. Oh, uh, it's available the presentation. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Oh, okay. All right. So, also, what we're doing is. So, should I unshare and reshare? Someone just no. added another. Question. No, I, I, I'll take it. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> Sorry, I just wanted to make sure. Okay. okay. So, um, we're also providing a wider facility on the north side of Cathedral Lane here. Uh, which today, as you guys can see in the images, is um, not a pleasant experience for even pedestrians. It's a very narrow sidewalk, and there are some um, utilities in the sidewalk and signs and things like that um, that we are hoping to improve with this buffer and widened sidewalk. And then in this instance, you can see there is still that preferred option where um, Sorry. Okay. So then you can see the facility continues along the north side of the sidewalk, and then it continues on Thomas, but the ramp is remaining open. So those are the two alternatives, both the much better conditions than what we have today, I must say, but they're quite different. One keeps the ramp open. Um, one for lots of new facility along the operating room. So there you have it. And then we have two options within this option where we widen the existing, which is a new sidewalk. So we wanted to honor that um, this wiper crossing development did just build a new facility 
Um, we could widen that to create a water trail, or we could create separated bike lanes and keep the existing sidewalk where it is. Okay, so now we're approaching the George Mason Drive intersection, and here our preference is to provide the 10 foot facility. Um, the intersection, though, provides some challenges for us because. There's not a lot of width out there today at, as we approach the intersection. So what we need to happen to get 10 feet out of this is we would need to push the sidewalk north into the existing um, buildings there. Uh, built, not buildings, but the existing land that is there. So there is a church, which we can see in this image. And then there are the Arlington Oaks condo association. You can kind of see a grade at the grade out or outline at the, in, uh, at the intersection, but it's set back much more than the church. So we do know that uh, this option will rely on property redevelopment where we can widen potentially um, through coordination with the owner for right away. And we, we did observe while we were out there that the building was for sale. So we do know that there is potential for redevelopment. Don't lie, I'll tell you that building is for sale for years. I used to live right there. Yeah. Uh, my son, his, his daycare was there when he was three. And, <laughs> and seeing adults. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Well, I wouldn't hold your breath. Okay. Well, we have another alternative yeah. if that doesn't work. So. Yeah. <laughs> so the other alternative is to um, remove a lane, which. Um, may have some issues with traffic queuing. So we know that this will be a challenging intersection. Probably the most challenging out of everything we will see today because it does require the removal of a lane for us to get the 10 feet um, and queuing. Because the queue lane, as you can see, onto Arlington Boulevard is right there near the pedestrian tunnel, except on the Arlington Boulevard side, um, it could cause some challenges. So that is the issue with this alternative. So we would have to figure out from a design perspective how that will work. And then, again, we're coordinating with our traffic team and VDOT on this because this is a VDOT facility, so they would have the last say. So as we cross over Arlington Boulevard on this bridge to the left and then come back to travel east, um, our preferred alternative here is to keep these two lanes on the service road there is some space for us to widen the trail to the south um, and get a 10 foot trail. There are, um, as we approach, there are three existing uh, property, um, single family residential properties adjacent to the National Bar Readiness Center. Um, and there are some trees that are nicely framing the sidewalk there. Um, we would pinch through those, well, we would create a pinch point or keep. Mm -hmm. Um, the sidewalk as wide as we can, uh, keep it so that it doesn't affect the trees but make it as wide as we can get it in that small section where those houses are before we approach the um, National Guard Readiness Center. And then once we pass that, we would widen it out to 10 feet um, as we approach the National Foreign Affairs Training Center. And what we're recommending is an, a median island here um, at the NFATC because it's just a sea of pavement today um, and this would at least provide some refuge for cyclists and pedestrians who are crossing um, at this location. And we, that this would require some adjusting of the Capitol Bike Show Station, but we would still have a wider trail at this location. And, and you can see what this looks like today. So the alternative to that um, was to remove one of the travel lanes from the service road and widen the trail to the north um, so that we wouldn't impact anything to the south and carry that template through. The issue with this is that by removing a lane, uh, we are concerned that it would provide quite a bit of queuing because the National Guard Readiness Center, the gate is right at, it abuts the road. So people queue in the street. So if we were to remove a lane, that lane that's effectively used for queuing would just happen in the one lane and it would back up on the charging center. 
But if there is redevelopment with the National Guard facility, if they decide to move their entrance, then hey, we have a great option, right? So for segment six, as you can see, and that's Chris Slatt on the Transportation Commission chair standing there in the sidewalk sideways, <laughs> I should add. Uh, that's what it looks like today. And you can see a vehicle approaching the off ramp adjacent to him. So that vehicle has all of that space and the pedestrian is barely situated in the sidewalk. So cyclists basically need to dismount and walk at this location because it feels very unsafe. Uh, so our proposal is to, it's the only option we have available to us because we have a wall, you can see in the image to the top right, um, just to the right of us with a fence for the National Guard, the National Foreign Affairs Training Center. So what we would do is widen out into the off-ramp, take space from there, and push the template through to get an adequate um, trail and a buffer at this location. And uh, we also heard that the Goodwill is planning to redevelop too. Oh, wow. Yeah, really? so this happened a couple months ago. So. I, I have not seen an application for the Goodwill, but it was uh, reported in the news that this will be the first location that they're planning, the Goodwill Industries facilities, uh, the Goodwill Industries is planning to redevelop for uh, multifamily residential as well as, <coughs> so I thought that was really interesting and a great opportunity for us um, if and when we do decide to implement this. Because after all, this is a feasibility study, so we don't know what the outcomes will be. So, um, so we're approaching segment seven now. You can see the white dashed line between six and seven. So at the intersection, the template is pushed through to the intersection, you cross over, and you now have this scenario where um, the service road heading eastbound back onto Arlington Boulevard is wide, just like the rest of the ones we have in the study area. They're all fairly wide, and we believe they can be narrowed to 16 comfortably just to provide some additional width for the trails. So this is the location where the trail would widen to the south um, and continue on the service road and provide a buffer for that separation. Okay, so then we continue that along to um, Arlington Boulevard, and there are residential dwellings, single family houses, all along the service road in this stretch, all the way to the Jackson Street Bridge. Um, this segment, most of it is currently um, being studied by VDOT. Well, it, it actually has already been studied by VDOT, and they are now in um, their request for proposals. They have a scope for um, design to remove uh, these driveways that exit right onto Arlington Boulevard. And the thought is that a trail would continue through there and there will be a service road provided specifically for those driveways so that they won't have access onto Arlington Boulevard anymore, which is a much safer condition because you won't have cars backing out onto a major roadway um, with speeding vehicles. And there are still some design considerations that need to be worked out. Uh, the fire department did say they needed more space for a turnaround. Um, so we need to work out some, some things related to that, but um, this is what we have now to, to go by. And there's also, um, this is something that wasn't in the first round of concepts. That it, as you can see where the trail becomes a Y, um, to the right of the screen. There is a heritage tree that sits right adjacent to the trail today. And um, Parks is concerned that the critical root zone would be heavily affected by any changes we make to this area. So the proposal is to, this is not a part of the STARS report. We added this and we're going to work with BDOT on whatever we decide to do here. Um, the proposal is to just avoid that. And then what we found was 
it also provides a better location for us to get back up to the trail um, at a gentle slope. So that that is the last segment for the concepts. If the stars report project does not go through, which we are there in um, their request proposals now, so I'm fairly certain it will. Um, we would just keep the trail widened in this existing location and maintain the trail um, and go around the trail. So we are publishing the report, hopefully within the next seven days. Fingers crossed on that. We really want to get it out because um, we're almost there. Um, then we would start working with VDOT on our operational and safety analysis. We call it an OSAR. Uh, we'll, we'll initiate that process. We have a document framework scope that we have already um, crafted and we um, have shared with VDOT, so we're working with them on that. And then after that, we look forward to requesting funding and um, impressing upon the board the importance of having this Arlington Boulevard Trail segment um, designed and constructed. <clears throat> and that is the end of the presentation. Wonderful. Thank you well, so much, Bridget. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to try and start off keeping it high level, but I know that there's a lot that we're going to want to dig into. So, Neil, I'd love for you to talk about Vision Zero questions you may have, any other things that may be going on. Um, but, yeah, please. I need to share my screen again because I imagine if we have questions. Oh, yes, yeah, 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 that'd be great. Um, okay, so first and foremost for me, um, what are the next steps that are for us really here? So when is this going to be going to the board? When will we need to gather our thoughts on our preferred options? I think first and foremost, seeing the um, feedback from the public was really informative. I think that first answer choice that said that people want things out of scope is a great reason for that we need to continue to fight for funding for studies like this. Mm -hmm. I think the second reason of do nothing is a great argument, like you said, to that public engagement process working. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to package that up in a letter eventually, um, not today. But um, what is the steps? Okay, so we have concluded the public engagement process. We're in commission briefings now. The next step is uh, the interim step, which is the OSAR with VDOT. And then we get into design. It is my understanding that at that point when we're in 30 percent design there may be some changes that will facilitate the need to come back to the public um, i'm not sure when that is uh, to answer the first part of your question in terms of when engagement will happen for that right, or if there are changes significant enough to that will require that the second part of the question is related to um tell me you asked the question Oh, uh, I think it's mainly just that, actually. So oh, okay. is it going to be dealt with in a piece-by-piece -piece oh. formation, or is it going to be all at once? So th that was the second part of the question yeah. you asked about CIP. Uh, yes, yeah. So um, CIP funding, the request, we start packaging up um, our gathering our thoughts for the CIP, working on that in the spring, and the fall is when we start with the board. So that would be 2024. Okay, so in my opinion, in my opinion, we probably would not write a letter on the study. I would strongly suggest that we all get really familiar with these options. I used to live in Arlington Oaks and very familiar with the queuing that happens on Arlington Boulevard at that intersection. And um, perhaps when it comes back to us in the fall, then as an actual project, we will have more opinions, hear more public support, have people come. And I have to say that we also have our online feedback form. Uh, that is closed, but we do have uh, a news, uh, an email option for you to still email me any comments that you have because the study will be posted and these recommendations are there and the previous engagement opportunities are there as well. So everything I'm showing you will be there and you, you are more than welcome to send me at any time anything you have so that uh, as we start to go through this process, if there are refinements, um, they can be considered. All right, I'll take it from commissioners in the room. Please raise your hand. Yeah, Richard. Would funding for this be all in the transportation budget, or would any of the parks, would it hit the parks budget? Do you know? I don't know. That's a great question. And you did ask me about CIP 
um, related to whether it would be one project yeah. or broken into multiple projects. Um, we are recommending that it's one project because it's easier to get funding for one large project and then we phase it into separate smaller projects. So I don't know um, to Probably answer your just question. But I didn't know if there was yeah, if there's official right of way or if they have to buy property, then yeah, right? I don't know. We'll have to see. That's why like, I think it's important to be familiarized with what the study outcomes are because they haven't made that decision yet. Mm -hmm. And there will come a time before next fall, supposedly, where the decisions are made between these options. So the drivers of this were the trails is sort of disconnected and doesn't allow easy access for pedestrians or bikers through that through those spots and it feels unsafe for most of and it, and it, and it, that was the number one driver we heard that a lot that just riding on the trail was very uncomfortable so in terms of providing pedestrian and bike access to those businesses and shops and dining areas and so on how many users are we talking about what's the throughput on that now I have those numbers. I can't tell you what they are at the top of my head. I believe for both north and south, it's around 400 a day, which from what I understand is yeah. low. Yeah, so I mean, I guess why I'm getting at this is we're also having a redo with the WNOD, and they're saying they need 18 feet. Okay. <laughs> and it's, oh, you got to have 18 feet. Yeah, we got to have 18 feet because we got this. We got to have this much space, okay. and we got to have all this. So I'm a little curious as to why we don't have to have that same standard and why we can make it less than that and i mean maybe it's not a state requirement but a negotiated thing and and wnod has the right away for that because they call theirs a transportation project and you're not calling this a transportation project it is a transportation it's a study right interesting so i'm just curious as to why one can be 18 feet and the other can less and sometimes it can be 10 feet and sometimes it can be well, not 10 I, feet. I certainly refer to the guidance from the NCP for what the preferred minimum width was for trails. Okay. Now when you say trail, you mean combination bike and pedestrian? Bike and pedestrian, multi-use trail. Okay. And these are, um, the pavement is asphalted or? Uh, In some segments, it's mostly concrete. concrete I think that, might be the, okay. that must be the designation, something yeah. about. Well, so because I get people, when people talk about trails and you think about park trails, well, those are wood chips. When you think about, oh, I see. I see. you see, okay. there's yeah. lots of different kinds of trails yeah. that we that we deal with. But okay, so no, so you, you've got 400 a day going through. So it's really not that much of a commuter route. Recommend, recollecting. Okay, it no, I'm just trying to get me. like you know the yeah. WOD is like the interstate of, of bike traffic. Yeah. And in fact, you know, it, you call, the, the nickname is the bike trail. So I wanted to know if is this a bike trail? It or, is a bike trail. And I can or give you is the actual not number a pedestrian once I get out of trail. This. I'll give you the actual number. No, but I mean what's what's the so pedestrian it is, it is part of it? It's a multi-use facility for cyclists and pedestrians. Um, so it's not pedestrians at their own risk. No, it's a multi-use <laughs> <trail. laughs> yeah. I get it. Okay. But I can tell you that number may go up once more people go up because some people just don't want to use it because it doesn't No, safe. okay, no, I've been on yeah. parts of that, but I haven't yeah. been there in a long time. No. Yeah. If this would me about because I have it. Mm -hmm. yeah, and also in that bike, particularly segment two, I think our like flat track is like that. And the one Chris Scott was on, I don't think it's possible to do it. Like, parks are terrible from here. Like, so I think. The, the Jersey barrier versus the guardrails, is there a significant cost? Um, I have looked at the cost estimate and I don't, the cost estimate didn't change from that, so I don't think it's significant. Okay, great. Yeah, good. Neil, do you want to please? Um, yeah, so, so kind of have a couple questions, um, kind of going back to that conversation we are just having before. You like, the, the entire section we're talking about here isn't all formally called the Arlington World Park Trail, right? Like, it's currently just like a smaller section. Um, and like the roads that make up this, this section that we're talking about aren't really like recognized as part of the trail currently, right?
Actually, the only part that's in the study that's not recognized as part of the trail is the part that we're adding, which takes you straight onto this on-ramp in segment three um, here. The rest is considered on the bike map as part of the Arlington Boulevard Trail, and there is a route that takes you through Cathedral and straight to points west, um, and it's not considered part of the trail. Okay. So just, the MTP says it's discontinuous um, on street, off street. And so I guess like the, the, the goal in mind after this, if, if this project comes to fruition and everything's finalized is to kind of like, because I'm not aware that that was like all considered part of the same trail. Um, is it, is the intention to like put signage up there and like make it clear that like this is all part of the, like a trail network that will bring you out like the airlines and Boulevard network? Um, we do mention we finding in the project and uh, we have a staff, another plan of working on making, um, creating a wayfinding package, even if this does not go through, mm -hmm. because it's not, that was something else that came out of this. It wasn't clear where to go. Um, so yeah, wayfinding would be a part of this, or, or just something that happens anyway. Yeah, is, is there a lot of like, in your feedback that you received, was there a lot of contention between pedestrians and cyclists' interactions on on we received sections. some feedback. People said there were conflicts that they were uncomfortable with. Um, most of the conflicts, conflicts people mentioned were pedestrian vehicle, cyclist vehicle, but some people did say they'd rather have a separate facility for pedestrians and cyclists. Okay. So, so it was, it was have a on street situation. Bicycle right? lane with a sidewalk or something. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just wanted to know how, how significant the but it wasn't um, that great. But we did. I did see a comment. Or okay. Two. Some people say cyclists ride, uh, ride too fast. Yeah, I, I would imagine. I just I was curious because some of those narrow sections, I can imagine there's a lot of potential like problems that happen when the sidewalk narrows to like four or five feet, and there's a cyclist and a pedestrian. I don't know how a cyclist could do that actually. Um, yeah. In that space adjacent to the road, but I mean, it happens. I actually have some images out. <laughs> There it yeah, he's walking half the time. Just so <laughs> yeah. Okay. All right. Anything else for people in the room? Just going through the presentation. Yeah, make a comment. No, right? Unfortunately, not. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. But you can send an email at this. Yeah, no, no, no. You can have an informal discussion. Yeah. I have a nature question here. We talked about mature trees. But the only way you get mature trees is if you have littler trees coming up behind them. So that means that if we don't have allow space to have the littler trees coming up behind them, those mature trees aren't going to be there in 15 years. So what I'm saying is, is are we only concerned about mature trees? Or are we concerned about what's coming up underneath the subject? We actually looked at all of the trees. I think there were only some in this area. I think it was where um, staff, DPR staff. Okay didn't seem to be as concerned with the trees. Okay. Um, I mentioned one mature tree specifically because it was a heritage tree that yeah. were very, very So concerned. Vincent's group looked at this and they Vincent said- Vincent and Melissa. Okay, all right, thank you. I worked closely with them. Great. Well, so thank you so much for being here, Virginia. We look forward to, to here. the study being published and next steps on the project itself. Um, I think it'd be great if there are any other moments where Parks and Rec could be beneficial or useful in maybe sorting out some of these decisions, please let us know. Okay. We can have you back. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for a good presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Walking us through seven seconds. I know. That's a lot. <laughs> it's a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> but it's so Legos worth with this. It's yeah. worth well, I know. <laughs> you know, and that was one, one of the feedbacks I gave the uh, consultants that I wish we could just show it all in one concept plan. But yeah, it, it, I think it lends itself that the Arlington 50 is a corridor that you can drive it well. You probably know what those sides are. So then you can imagine what this on, off, on, off. Like that is an easy thing. Visualizing problems there. Yes. Having yeah. some experience. Because it's kind of that road. <laughs> I think that the nice thing about breaking it down into those sections was I, I could I was able to visualize and follow along right on the maps. maps. Yeah. Oh, on my okay, computer, yeah. like visualizing it as you're like going through step by step and looking at specific intersections. Um, 
one point. So that was helpful to compartmentalize that. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. All right, guys, we have a little bit of an uneventful rest of the meeting. I'm going to, we have a staff report. We do. Uh, no additional updates related to that. All right. Um, we do have commissioner reports as well that have been submitted. Thank you, Neil, for the Vision Zero one. I'm not going to sit here and bore us with talking through it right now. I don't think it's the best use of our time, especially since we're not all of us will contribute. So, moving on from there, we're going to skip other business. Yes, uh, we previously had letters to the county board and a letter regarding Quincy Park, but I believe that item will be tabled to next month at the earliest. Correct. All right, so then officially I'm going to adjourn the Parks and Recreation Commission for April. Thank you all for joining us today. We hope to meet quorum in person next month, and I think we'll be more successful in doing so. To all of our folks on the phone, please feel better soon to your partners, to your families. You know, take your emergency and wear masks, wear judicious. I'll try and do my best as well. So yeah, Let's talk to you guys soon. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, oh, yeah. I could come back. It comes yeah, feel free to speak now. Yeah. I would say that for the 